This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Isotope, Sonarworks, and API. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Spectra 1964 STX100 mic pre in an API lunchbox mixed carefully through Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. In fact, I was talking to a rather well-known musician the other day. He's been around for 40 years, and he started using the 600 and hearing stuff he hadn't heard before. And I said, yeah, but I said, I've had complaints about that because musicians that weren't at your level, all of a sudden their mistakes could be heard because the amplifiers weren't overloading. You know, they're kind of like a lie detector. If you had issues, it's, it's going to show up because the overload is not as readily apparent anymore. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. In my studio, I've got the Mac Mini M1 paired up with the OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Hub Expansion Solution to connect to all my dedicated audio drives, sample libraries, and backup drives. It's the perfect size to stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or older Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. The Spectra 1964 C610 comp limiter brings fast, clean, quiet compression and limiting to your recordings and mixes. The C610 includes the famous Spectra 101 amplifier used in legendary studios like Stax, Ardent, and Record Plant. I love using my C610s for drums, vocals, guitars, and especially bass, which now sounds bigger than anything I've ever recorded before. Make your mixes rock at spectra1964.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Bill Cheney, co-owner with Jim Romney of Spectra 1964. Bill designs mic preamps, EQs, and compressor limiters for studios, following in the footsteps of William Dilley, who founded the original Spectrasonics company back in 1964. Bill has also been an awesome guest on the podcast before to talk about the history of Spectrasonics and Spectra 1964 on episodes 227 and 269, so you should check those out too. And today, we're going to talk about what's new over at Spectra 1964 and the importance of understanding audio peaks how they affect your recordings, mixes, and productions, and ultimately your masters, and how Spectra 1964 handles peak content to make sure your recordings sound amazing, like many of the great records recorded with the Spectra 101 amplifier circuit, including Aerosmith, ZZ Top, Kiss, and John Lennon, to name just a few of them. And I have an amazing Spotify list, which will be included in the show notes, that you can go check out that are just many of the great records that have been recorded on Spectra um, amplifiers. So please welcome Bill Cheney back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Bill, are you ready to rock, my friend? I am. Greetings from Ogden, Utah. Right on, dude. What's what's the weather like there? Of course, when this comes out, it'll be a little different, but at the yeah. moment, what's the weather like there? It's getting cold, finally. It? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Finally got into the 20s. And again, you're close to Salt Lake, is that right? About half an hour away. Okay. All right. Do you ever have to buy salt or do you just go to the lake? Uh, we buy it. They they use mag chloride rather than salt because of the problems with salt and rust. So a few years ago, they went with magnesium chloride, which freezes at a lower temperature and doesn't tear up your car. Ah, nice. So that's, so that's what we use. <laughs> mag well, chloride. cool. 
Well, Bill, tell us um, tell us a little bit about how you're doing. What's what's new with you guys over at Spectre 1964? I mean, you you can give us a, a brief introduction to yourself if you want, but of course we've we've got a couple of great episodes where you really went into depth on that. Right. There's there's no reason for that. Uh, we've been working on a few uh, new products. The uh, the 100D, which you got a chance to try, and we finally got the Stereo DI out, uh, which took a few extra months to get uh, in line. We've we've like others we've struggled with with parts availability and uh, but we're now ahead of the curve at least for the next six months, uh, so we've we're at least uh, in good shape on the parts. But uh, it's just been an up and down situation with yeah. labor and parts. So it's it's not perfect, but we could be in far worse shape than we are. So well, no we're complaints. glad you guys uh, had the the preparation to be ready for this stuff. Well, we're not always prepared. It's, we get shocked occasionally, but. Uh, some of our suppliers have really worked with this and uh, which made a big difference. Right on. So yeah, I have the STX 100D, which you sent over and um, recently actually did an interview with Linda Taylor where we got to talk about it too. I love the sound of that mic preamp. I've been using it on guitars and I, and I think I mentioned this, that they just make my guitars sound real to me when I record through it. I feel like I'm really hearing the guitar coming through a speaker in a way that makes me want to perform. Right. Well, it's the, it's the original stack circuit. I mean, it, the stack circuit was dual 101s with a transformer. And the issue prior to now was uh, physically putting all of those components within a single width 500 format uh, module. And it, We've 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 had you know we've had to work work around that, but now we've got it to work properly, and so it's exactly what you would get out of that era as far as that circuit. It's uh, the dual one on ones with the transformer on the output, and I, we did a lot of testing with it with uh, that circuit with the one on ones and the transformers, and we had a few customers who had that circuit, and we went back and forth. And their come away on the final revision was it's the same, which is uh, allowed us to release it. But it, it's it is wow, that's amazing. Really a great circuit. So I, I imagine um, you know one of the challenges is just ha- making sure that you have enough sort of power in a 500 rack. And I know you've talked about that some before, um, but it's pretty cool to hear that those who might have you know used the original versions of it which I imagine probably have honking power supplies are hearing it sound similar to the same circuit in the 500 series? Well, it's it's not power supply related. Our, our circuits, I think I've covered this a little bit in the past, that whole circuit in the 100D draws less than 50 mils. So that means with a typical 500 uh, power supply, you could uh, do well over 20 of those without power supply issues. So Wow. Uh yeah, we're not it's it's a miser when it comes to power requirements. It doesn't take much at all to make that thing sing. And that's at plus eighteen out, uh full output, you know, the forty I think it's forty mils is what that circuit draws. Yeah. Well, let's see, what else maybe we should keep talking about the one hundred D for a moment. Um first of all, it's a nice black faceplate which looks awesome in the rack. <laughs> Great. It's nice, you know, up against the silver STX uh, 100s. Right. And and um, I do feel like I've had a tendency to have more headroom or, or gain it up higher when I use it. What do you want to say about that? Um, the 100, I might set the gain somewhere for a microphone for voice or for guitar, but I feel like on the 100D, I might uh, have more room to bring the gain up hotter. Well, there, there are different first stage. The STX-100, the previous model, is a 110, uh, which typically is a little hotter circuit. Uh, and so that's why you're, 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 uh, you're getting the difference in gain on the first stage. And the 101 uh, didn't have the, uh, uh, the dynamics if you want to say, because it's, it's not bipolar, single-ended supply. And I don't want to get too technical, but it just basically is operating on half the voltage. Yeah. And 10 I, does. 
If and I so remember my um, if I remember my electronics class, that's sort of like the discussion of class A amplifiers versus class A B or something like that. Is that well, ballpark? Um, you don't have to get too deep into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just one. One is operating at plus or minus sixteen volts, which is the one ten, and the one hundred one, which is in the one hundred D, is operating twenty four volts. Oh, cool. To, to right. ground. So you're, you're talking about an 8-volt differential. It's, okay. it's, it, that's the simplest way to explain it without getting a chalkboard. But uh, uh, the 110 had a little more headroom. And, uh, but the, the, on the flip side, when people hear the 101 compared to the 110, some of the conventional artists prefer the sound of the 101. It's a, there's a slight difference. I have a hard time hearing the difference, but it is, it, it's there. And it's, it's basically because of the power supply rails. Because they're essentially the same circuit, except for um, one part of the circuit, which is bipolar. And uh, but the front end is all the same between well, that's, the one hundred one and the one hundred and ten. So, and when you say one hundred one and one hundred and ten, again, um, in the use case scenario, we're kind of talking about the STX one hundred and the one hundred D. Right. Although in the reverse order, right? The one hundred and ten circuit is in the one hundred. That's the correct. The one hundred and one circuit is in the one hundred D. That's correct. Yeah, That's and, and I, you know, it's funny because I have both in the studio and I've gone back and forth on them and I hear a remarkable difference. Yeah. They yeah. both sound amazing. They both sound fantastic. Right. Right. But the 100 has a quality that um, sounds more forward to me and the 100D sounds um, uh, transparent and in a way that, you know, it just sounds like it's got depth to it and I, and I want to turn it up louder, turn it up hotter to get well, the same signal. If you look at the circuit, it's a little more rounded. I mean, it's it's uh, its behavior is a little more rounded. It's not as transparent. And we use the one ten and the v, and the V six ten because we don't want any any color at all. Okay. And so the one ten is more like a wire, where the uh, the one one is not. And so, and there's subtle differences. You say they're major, and you know, I, I believe you, but. Um, the 110 came out in 1971 and was in all the later consoles, the 1024 series. And the STX100 basically is a 1024 circuit, where the D model is prior to 1971. And uh, that was the record plant, New York, uh, Stax, Ardent, uh, AdVision, across the pond. That was that circuit. And so they're two distinct circuits. And I know... What's interesting when we were doing original prototype work, the engineers could pick them out immediately, which was which. But in in selling both products, they use both for different reasons. And so yeah. it's not you replace one with the other. You said, well, on this, I use the 100, and this one, I use the D. Yeah. So and, and so that's what I, I get that comment a lot with a lot of the prototypes that went out. Well, as engineers, sometimes we also just use what we've got in, in that order, you know, right. too. Right. <laughs> we right. got two of these. Okay, those might be the stereo pair. And we got one of these. Okay, that'll be the mono one. But right. um, but they both sound awesome, and it's it's a lot of fun to use them. I, I love the sound of stuff I've been recording through them. Um, drums. I've been doing a lot more, um, you know, uh, guitars and vocals, bass. Um, one of the things I love using is the BBDI straight into the 610 for bass. And I've been using the, the SCX 600s on, um, guitar mics, just, you know, 57s straight on an amp. And those sound great. There's something really cool about happens with all these different pieces of gear. You know, the 600s have the built-in comp limiter and they just sort of, um, they just sort of compact the guitar for you a little bit at recording right you know right. it sounds really nice the headroom and then another thing i noticed and i'll i'll let you have the mic again here <laughs> bill but Hold on. but i you know i was i got i've been getting into synthesizers and i took my synths and I, and I ran them through the stx 100s and good lord i mean it's like it brings out everything that you love about the synthesizer all the right kind of harmonic saturations and I don't know. I mean, I know you say it's more like a wire, but I just feel like it's bringing out everything I wanted to hear, and it makes the synths way more exciting to go through those pre's on the way in. Well, it's not losing information. It's not losing harmonics. Uh, it's not that we're adding any, and we'll talk about it a little bit later when we talk about peaks, but 
it, it's preserving what's at the input. And that's, that's just an indication of what you're losing with conventional gear. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, this is even compared to just going line in straight into Pro Tools. If I go through the STX instead, it just sounds better. Well, Love again, it. it's, it's the headroom with the gain and then how it's, in, you know, how it's handling the transients. It's, yeah, that's it's a, fascinating. It's a big deal. Well, uh, where should we, uh, what, what question should I ask next? Should we start talking about why headroom and, and you know, talk about the idea of peaks or, or do you want to? Yeah. Well, you guys yeah. have, um, do you have any more new stuff going on at, at 1964 that you want to mention? Well, we, we did we get the, we did get the stereo BBDI out, which you've got now. Yeah. And that one, we took a little extra time because it, it's, it was primarily made for keyboards and the bass guitar guys really love it, but we did a little bit different, uh. A response curve on the high frequency and we went back and forth with different keyboard people and asked them you know which one do you like and how do you like it and there were some subtle differences and a couple of circuits so that stereo this two channel di has that characteristic so it has a little different flavor than the regular bbdi but it's not adding anything it's just how we handle the uh frequency response above 10 kilohertz it's just but people can hear it you know it, there is a difference yeah Before your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs and notes in one place. But setting up a shared cloud folder can be frustrating. There's always someone in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Samply.app makes it easy to add collaborators to a project so that the whole band can upload new songs and make comments before the session. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music. Just upload a voice memo or song and start commenting. Sign up for your free account with two projects now now at Sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. Want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone, Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on this podcast episode. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Yeah, well, uh, what's cool to me, um, I was doing some comparisons with uh, again with a keyboard going in, and it was cool to just hear that you sort of have that option. You can try you can tr try the keyboard straight in. You can go through the one hundred STX one hundreds, or you can go through the BBDI stereo into the STX one hundreds and straight in. And they all just have useful tone variations that that you might choose one. I don't think I would choose straight into Pro Tools. I think I'd always go through your gear yeah. on the way in, though. <laughs> again, there's a re there's a reason why. And, and we'll hit a bit, a little bit. We'll hit it in just a minute with what what the differences are and why you know why you hear that difference. So now, to, uh, what, there are some other added features to the BBDI, right? I think we have the um, the pad built in, right? We, and that was another uh, issue that arose when we started doing the the twenty dB pad or eighteen dB pad for high level. Uh, we did a few different things that typically aren't done in DIs, and so. Uh, what the result was is some pads will affect performance. And um, that one is fairly transparent. It's a really clean pad that uh, doesn't affect what you're hearing. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, let's see. Let's talk about headroom a little bit. Let's talk about why um, it's important for us to understand audio program peaks. What What right. is that? It sounds sounds fancy. Well, the the peak thing I was raised with because, as you remember, previous conversations I from my early years, you know, early twenties, when I became involved with Spectrosonics, that was the first lecture, and so I was always uh, in tune with what worked and what didn't work and why. And the problem is in in our industry is it's not always talked about. Because there's really no definitions that have been set in stone. Everybody has their own version of what a peak is. And it started in the mid-30s. You know, and the Germans and the British and U.S. engineers, they all were starting to come up with what is a peak and how do we monitor that peak and what is the amplitude. 
And in, in short, they didn't come up with anything was consistent or realistic, according to how we look at a peak. And so uh, if you look at the math on some of the attack times and what they said a peak transient was, they were typically in the audible range. So it, what happened was, was the, the control of that peak and the resulting problems from that peak uh, were actually the instrument affected them. So you could hear them. That's the bottom line. You could hear the overload and uh, the results, the disastrous results of the overload. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe we should maybe we should break down a little bit more, sort of dumb, dumb down the mm -hmm. the description of a peak. Because I think when we listen to that, we think of a couple of things. We think, oh, you mean when the meter goes over and we see the red light clipping? And we also think, or we might think, oh, a, a drum hit, you know, you see a spike on your Pro Tools or in your, you know, in your, whatever your DAW you're recording, and you see that sort of spike on the waveform. We might think of that as a peak. Um, what are, is it, are we in the right ballpark for that? Or are there other descriptions? Well, that, that's, where the that's where the confusion comes. Uh, there's no definition. And so the peak like you have on one console to the next or one device to the next, they operate in different uh, different parameters. There's no set uh, speed at which that light indicates a peak. And in most cases, the peak has hit the moon and come back. That indicator is so slow that you don't even really realize where it's at as far as amplitude and the intensity and, and the duration. And so the, the light just tells you, uh, yeah, there's there was information there above a certain level. And, right. And, if and this that's was what if confuses this was, people. Yeah. If this was the world of charts, you would call that a lagging indicator, right? Exactly. And so what happens is you'll be tracking along, and you're and the peak light's not going on, and you, then you listen, you play it back, and there's distortion. Yeah, it's like when you record tambourine, and right, you just hear this crunchy thing going. on. You hear on crunchy the things, and the VU meter was never moving, and there was no peak light. In fact, one of the tests for our mic pre's is to get car keys and shake them in front of a microphone, and it's doubtful the meter will even deflect, but you hear hard distortion. Well, those are transients, mm. peaks, that the instruments don't even recognize. And so what you're doing is you're kind of flying blind. When you say you, instruments, I want to be careful of our terminology. So we don't mean basses and guitars. We mean measurement instruments. No, like, I mean I mean guitars and drums. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so cut this more briefly is what everybody came up with over a period of time was, will you have the 10 dB rule? You know, just give yourself 10 dB of headroom and that'll get keep you away from peak overload. Well, that's not true because then we go into what is our definition of a peak. And our definition of a peak is that it is well beyond 100 kilohertz. It has no musical program and it's purely voltage. So if you monitor with an oscilloscope a strike on a drum or a kick or snare, you will notice on the scope, when I'm talking up to a megacycle or higher, you'll notice that the peaks are above 20 dB. In a lot of cases, 25, 26 dB above where the meter's reading. So 10 dB doesn't work. And Okay, we, can, I, can I add something to that? So I think a, a potential confusion is when we hear a single, like a voltage spike, but then we also hear you using the term frequencies. We think of frequencies as going up and down. But um, I guess a thing for us to remember and understand is when you have a, a vertical square wave, a, a, an instantaneous voltage spike, within that are, it, it sort of represents and uh, almost infinite number of frequencies, right? Is that the way we should think about that? Because you're you're talking about mega cycles, but we but it's a spike. We haven't even gotten a single. We haven't even gotten a half cycle yet. We've just got a wall. You you, and you basically have no music programming. It's right. basically just voltage. And and that was the hardest thing for us to explain initially when we brought the company back to life was we're not limiting any music. We're limiting just the transient voltages that come with the instrument, with the music, like. A hot pickup on a guitar, 20 dB, easily. Uh, and those voltage spikes ride in front of the waveform. Hmm. So what, what happens is, is the amplifier tries to reproduce that peak. 
And if it doesn't have the wherewithal to reproduce it, any number of things happen. Distortion, uh, loss of harmonics. You have to turn it down so then you're more into the noise floor. You lose a lot of, of the intensity of what the instrument's producing just by having to reduce that level and get rid of the distortion. So that's where we get into this thing called, are you a technician or are you, a, you know, an artist? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the guys in the mastering field love our V610s because it, the peak's gone. They put it in front of the chain. Everything behind it is operating in a peak-free environment. And then they can focus on what is going on with the music, not reading some device saying, oh, I just overloaded. So you so. guys are, it's, should we think about it like STX or excuse me, like Spectra is passing along that, that spike wall peak or is managing it so that it doesn't hit the next gear in the chain? We do it two ways. The mic pre's, the 100, the 100D, pass it. Okay. Okay. So if you want, if you put a scope on the output of our our uh, mic pre's, you'll notice that the transients are there. There's no clipping, and that's why we always give this uh, one microsecond, one thousand percent overload spec. And, it, and it, it's kind of a subjective thing, but what it says is, is you can run all the peaks you want through it. It's not going to clip from the peaks. It'll still pass the music program material and all the harmonics. Now, when you get to our limiters, no. The limiters eliminate the peak. So the advantage to that is anything that follows it is now operating in a peak-free environment. That's why when you put our limiters in front of someone else's gear, it sounds better. I like that. Do you guys have T-shirts that just say peak-free environment, Spectra 1964? (laughs) (laughs) That might be an idea. Well, we've had a lot of customers who are thinking of selling some of their other gear. And they put a 600 or a 610 in front of their gear, and all of a sudden it wakes up. And it sounds entirely different because it's operating peak-free. Now, that's going to be a function of our limiters, our compressor limiters. But again, on the mic pre's, we just pass it. And uh, in fact, Matt Rossbank sent me some tracks oh, six, seven years ago, and they were on they, no, no peak limiting, just right out of his Spectre desk. He has an older Spectre desk. And I measure 25, 26 dB peaks above average. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of amplitude. Yeah. And they're just, they're just voltage. They have nothing to do with music. So when you get into our specifications for our limiter, that's why we say, the attack time of our lim- limiter is 90 nanoseconds, less than one-tenth of a microsecond. And so that's, again, operating way above 500 kilohertz, but it, and it'll strip that peak off. In fact, if you get guitars with hot pickups and you have a musician that's getting aggressive, you'll hear that popping and clicking and popping. Yeah, yeah. You run it through our limiters, gone. And all that was was voltage. It's just stripping that off. Yeah, you know? I've noticed that on the bass too. So if I if right. I'm cutting bass through the six tens, it really controls that. Um, you know, you can get aggressive with the sound. You can go a little crazy on the instrument, which can feel right as a performance. But instead of the sound sort of sounding wacky, you know, it just sounds like it's dialed in. It sounds cool. You know, okay, well, it gets back to being an artist versus a technician. Yeah, and and I know a lot of guitarists have told me they can. They can. They don't sit there and have worry about the engineer yelling at them. Oh, you just pop the track. I mean, you just back off because that goes away. Yeah. That well, away. and I think that must be what I love about cutting through the six hundreds for guitar. Right. Same thing. I feel like I can really just play, and it all sits in the sits great in the mix and sounds awesome. Right. Now, um, if you don't mind, let me rewind a tiny bit and ask you again, related to that. Why do you think that my synthesizer would sound so much better through the STX-100 on its way into Pro Tools instead of just going straight into Pro Tools? Um, Because you say it's passing the peak along. Well, the thing is, if you're using it as a mic pre where it has gain involved, Mm -hmm. when you have gain involved and you have some transient issues, what will happen is, is the 100 absorbs that. Okay, so all it's reproducing out the other end is less than, say, 10 dB of range you're going to use on your next gain stage. It's not using, it's not amplifying the full amount. 
So when we say our amplifiers are, let's just go back to a mic pre. You've got essentially 60 dB, 60 dB sitting there of gain. Well, if you've got 20 dB worth of peaks riding on top of that 60, you can see the first stage takes the most abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you can have the device absorb that transient and just out the other end, deal with, let's say, plus four out, you know, just normal audio levels out into the next stage, which would be your, let's say, your DAW, it doesn't have to deal with that gain structure. And so what happens is it's, it, it operates at a lower amplitude level, lower gain stage, lower amplification. And so that 100 takes care of, it does the lifting. And then the next stage is a lot happier. It doesn't have to deal with the transient. As yeah, it's fascinating. So I guess it's like, even if the levels look the same at the next stage, um, it would just have an easier time with the input because you're not getting a sort of an invisible voltage spike at your input. And, and this has been a surprise to us because I didn't think keyboards were going to sound that much better through our stuff. I really didn't. They really did. They made no. me, it made me want to just go make, well, make synth records. <laughs> well, it, but, it, but it, you know, when I got the DI phone calls, uh, I just, you know, because they were supposed to be a, for a guitar and they're plugging their keyboards into it and say, my keyboards never sounded this good before. And I'm going, ah, it can't be. And then I started thinking about, and it's a whole different reason in, in the DI, but, but, where there's not a lot of transient levels. Now, some of these newer synths, the more expensive, you know, they do create transients. You know, these old modular pieces, they do right, have transient right, issues. Right. Yeah. But the, key, the typical keyboard is is not producing, you know, it's in the 6 to 8 to 10 dB, you know, peak to average. It's not like a drum at 20. And so I was just guessing, oh, you'll hear a difference, but it won't be that. But it's it's substantial, and I've had a lot of phone calls you know, about what you're talking about. Right on. The API Select T25 is a classic two-channel FET feedback style compressor limiter with a Class A tube output stage and custom API transformer, allowing split mono or stereo mode. Built with dual triode vacuum tubes, sidechain de-essing, detent controls for accurate recall, and API's famous thrust mode, the T25 represents a new design in tube compression. Bring the legendary sound of API to your home studio with the new Select T25 at apiaudio.com. You've already invested in your speakers, headphones, and the sound treatment of your studio. So you're ready to make great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world when they leave the studio. The problem is that the frequency response of your room is not allowing your speakers to tell you the whole story. Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can solve this for you by calibrating your speakers and headphones EQ and balance so that you can now make better mix choices. Start with a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com well um let's see so so the peak definition was in def not defined but you guys arrived at a way to to manage it um are we still sort of like you know collectively in search of a definition of peak in the recording world or um can we can we lay that one to rest have you won the peak wars <laughs> well no not necessarily because everybody's again got their own definitions, but the big thing I wanted to point out today was the peak light doesn't tell you anything because it's, you know, if you're doing drums, you're probably well beyond that light even going on before it even goes on. Uh, if you're doing vocals, um, not so much, you know, you're under 10 dB peak to average, but if you get into the percussive stuff or the guitars, that peak light makes it really hard to tell with what you're dealing with. You know, at what point? And, and again, there's no standards. Yeah. Um, there's no standards. Now, ours, ours is, you know, anything faster than, you know, like it's defined for, you know, multi hundred kilohertz range and above. And it's only voltage. That's it. There's no music program at all. That's our definition. But in some of the other definitions, it involves music program. And so you're, you're actually reading the music as part of the peak where ours is just purely reading the voltage. Now, the threshold light on a 610 or a STX 600, that circuit works like an oscilloscope. It's not a standard peak light, and it's operating in the megacycle range is how fast it is. And so 
there's way we monitor the current of the circuit, which will indicate and then hold the light on because it's so fast you wouldn't even fire the light. So there's some things going on that that threshold circuit that's different than a normal peak light. Okay. Um, maybe now's a good time for you to talk about how to use the lights as part of the way you set the levels through the STX and the 610s, right? And is, is it right. fairly similar? Because I think you have sort of a peak light that's, well, you got sort of a peak light on the S STX that feels like it's related to the first knob. There's two knobs on there. And then another one for the output knob. Um, and then I think the 610 has one that is sort of a threshold light and then an output peak light as well. Right. Two, they're two different circuits, two different concepts. The STX100, and I'll go back a little bit in some history here. When we first started building mic pre's, and we were sending them offshore, you know, overseas with some bands you've heard of, and we'd run against a competitor, they sounded remarkably the same. And I'm thinking, what what's going on here? These and what we found out was everybody was setting up the first stage like everybody else's. They were staying away from the peaks. And so what we did, we made a conscious decision. We're going to put a regular peak light, which is just going to basically monitor what the VU meter would show, maybe a little faster. But it, then we encouraged people to turn the input up until that light flashed. Now, you, yeah. you, from your experience, you've noticed when it flashes, it doesn't distort. But no, I mean, I can push it. If I keep pushing it, you right. get a distortion. You, and I you, think I think you even said that ZZ Top took advantage of that for right. some of their direct guitar sounds, right? Oh, if your thing goes full red, yeah, you're, you're RMS clipping. But what happened was everybody was using our mic pre's like everybody else's, and they were using that 10 dB rule thing. And they had no life to them at all. I mean, they just Right, they were undergaining. They weren't right. turning them up enough. And And the important part is the reason our pre sounds so good is because if you can gain 10 dB, let's just use that, that number, in dynamic range, that's huge. That gives you, the, it makes your music more impressionable. I mean, you've got dynamics, you're getting hit. You know, the kick sounds like a kick. The snare sounds like a snare. You can hear, yeah. feel, you can hear and feel the attack. But if you're down in the noise floor running from the peak, it becomes really boring. And so that's why we started putting regular peak lights on the STX and some of our other gear because we wanted, we were encouraging people to turn things up and get that thing to flash occasionally. And if you want to overdrive it, it's still not going to distort like a regular conventional amp because there's no peak overload. It'll just be RMS clipping, much like a tube amplifier does when you overdrive it. The harmonics are there, but it's just a lot more thick. And so that's why we put the peak light on the STX is we want people to turn that first input stage up. And uh, it's really important. Now, when you get to the threshold light on a 610, different world, it's the opposite. What we're trying to do there is show when the peak initially crosses the input. Okay, so when that thing occasionally flashes, and let's say we have it on a kick drum, most typically that's 20 dB down from where the meter sees it. Okay. And this is so the that, threshold light, the first light, the, the yellow the, light, I think, right? Right, that's the threshold light. And so that just shows the peak hit. Now, you're looking at it going, it isn't doing anything. Yes, it is. It's starting to limit the peaks. Now, if you look, going to these mastering houses that have V610s, they barely have that light flickering, but it's peak limiting. The more you turn that up, it gets more and more consistent. When it gets really consistent, then you get into compression. Right. But But you won't hear it. You won't hear it compressing, but... It is compressing. But initially when that thing flashes, that is me meaning the peak has crossed the threshold, the voltage peak, and you're limiting. And so it's a different setup than we would use as a normal peak light, RMS light on our other gear. So, And that's where I tell people to start when they buy our gear. Just use it as a peak limiter. Do not get into the compression. Just, And they'll notice huge, huge changes just from the peak limiter. I'm sure you heard it. You know, just stripping the peaks off of it and running it into whatever, and uh, but that's the difference. Yeah, well, um, I'm I'm probably most familiar with how the C610 works when I'm using it on bass, because right. I feel like that's the place where I'm really trying to do something with it, and I probably am going for compression, and it it it, it tames 
the bass players, especially when you're when you're working with a bass player that just rocks out and they're sort of not, you know, as an engineer, you might find yourself thinking, oh, they just don't understand that they need to, you know, be more controlling of their technique or I need to bring them into the control room so they can really be careful with the sound. And I think sometimes we just forget that, you know, like when you're just on a stage playing bass and through an amp, you know, you just kind of rock out and and maybe the amp soaks up some of that stuff. But the C610 does that for you with the direct signal where it controls, like you said, those spikes and everything. Um, but it allows you to get a, a great sort of level bass tone if you want it. You can back it off and let it breathe more, or you can compress it a little bit more. But again, it's different from my experience with other compressors. I don't feel like I'm trying to sculpt the, the um, envelope of the instrument quite in the same way. It feels more transparent and like you can just push it and it's just the instrument's still there, but it just kind of, you know, well, it what's, keeps what's, going, you know? <laughs> well, 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 a couple of things. Our compressor doesn't change in frequency response, irrespective of how much compression you have. So there's not going to be that anomaly. The second thing is the peak is not modulating the compressor. The peak is a separate function. And so all the peak limiting is doing is allowing you to get rid of the peak, turn everything up. And then the compressor operates as a volume compressor, but it's like a fast volume control. Uh, it attacks almost as fast as the, the limiter circuit. And the release times is where a lot of the bass guys play games. They'll extend the release yeah, times. Yeah. That, and that's probably what you've done is, is you can get some real nice, you know, they're not, I don't want to say anomaly, but it, it does sound better, you know, if you extend the release time sometimes. So it's, but the, the difference is it's a very musical piece. It, you don't, can't tell that it's even in the circuit. Yeah, it's, it's, it retains its transparency if you're doing a lot or a little. Right. That's, that's, that's one of the ways it makes it feel different, too. Yeah, you're not going to alter, but everything that follows that device, like your DAW, all of a sudden you can turn the input levels on it up because yeah, the, peak, totally. the, the peaks are gone. And we're back into that dynamic range scenario again. That's the impact of recording. You know, yeah. how much? I haven't tried a, an 808 kick drum through it yet, but I bet that would be pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the early, the early, uh, Aerosmith, I uh, one of the engineers told me it was plus twelve at fifty on the kick, and it we yeah. our wow. stuff our stuff will do plus twelve at fifty. It doesn't care, and that's why you get that that really intense dynamic sound. So again, it's uh, in the world of recording noises. Your noise floor is fixed, and you're always trying to get as far away from that as you can without getting into audible distortion within reason. And so if you can eliminate the peaks, it allows you to get that much further above that fixed noise. And that's well, what we're trying to do. Well, that's awesome. Let me let me back up for a moment to continue talking about um, the instrument. You're talking about guitar, uh, attack on drums. You use the word attack. And so I'm, I'm going to spin it to uh, what I learned from synthesis class way back when, because I'm Recently, very back into synthesizers. I love them. Um, but what I remember learning about sound um, in, you know, basically synthesis class was that you have the tones of sound, but it's the attacks of, of the sound that uh, let us identify as a human with our ear, identify what instrument that is and the sort of the expression that goes with that instrument. So, you know, a classic study would be to take, I don't know, like, a horn, a guitar note, and a piano note, and remove the attack and only listen to the sustain, and you would discover, you're like, oh, wow, these really sound very similar, these instruments, versus when you include the attack and it's you know carefully recorded, you immediately, your ear identifies which instrument that is and you know how it's being played and all that. So there's a, to reinforce your point, Bill, there's a ton of identifying information in that very beginning of a note. And it sounds like what you're doing is with your design, you're trying to have a huge amount of respect for that immediate beginning of a note. And I think that's why when we hear an instrument recorded through um, the Spectra gear, through the STX and stuff, it, we say, oh, that sounds, that's really sounds real. You know, it's why I think I can play a cleaner guitar overdub 
that is really fun to play through the amp, but when I typically might have heard it in the control room, I might have thought, oh, I better put a distortion pedal on there and gain it up more, make it more exciting. But I don't feel that same need when I'm recording through the 100D. That's right. Well, then, and again, to remember, you, you have the attack, and that's, you know, that, that rise time is, is really important. Now, some folks will use a class A circuit. And I'm not going to into class circuits today. That's not part of this discussion, but that's what they're trying to do is the transistor's operating full cycle. It's not turning off and on, and you're supposed to be able to capture that initial transient. The issue is, is right after that initial transient is when the overload occurs in the amplifier. So as it, the transient occurs, the power supply runs out of soup, let's say, <laughs> just doesn't have enough gain, and the amplifier will pull down for a given period of time. And that's your harmonics. That's why a recorded kick or snare doesn't sound the same when you play it back, because you see here the initial transient and then it falls off and mm -hmm. i have a lot of, i have a lot of drummers that say i don't have to boost 4k or two well, let's say three to 4k on your mic pre's well that tells me that the conventional amplifier is falling off the harmonics are falling off and what they're having to do is artificially boost them with an equalizer and we don't Wait, you mean not using if they use something non-spectral you're saying if right, they use yeah. some other piece of gear they they require more EQ to bring it back to life. Yeah, because you've lost it. And in some cases, it yeah. doesn't exist, so you're artificially boosting something that was lost in the overload. And so that's why it never sounds right. It just, it just lacks. A snare is one of our demos with a C610. You put a 57 directly into a C610, go right to your DAW, and then play it back. Go, you... First, you can go in 6 to 10 dB hotter than you normally would. And the second thing is when you play it back, you can hear the attack and you can hear the harmonics. And that's, that's where the awesome. mind and that's where the mind says, it's all there. We haven't created anything. We just preserved what came in on the input. So Yeah. But the EQ thing, just briefly, we try not to sell EQs. We have, I think, the best EQs in the world, because especially for two bus mixing and things like that. You and I talked about it, but mm -hmm. what what typically happens, we tell the customer, just buy the STX-100 to get started, then call us back if you think you need an EQ. Well, most of the time they don't call us back because when they hear what they're getting through the 100 by itself, they go, I don't need an EQ. And so that's, that's, uh, that says we're doing our job, that it does, yeah, yeah. It's not, doesn't need to be changed because we can get another discussion about EQ, what it does and yeah, that, that's been my experience is I, I record through the STX and I just tend to not need an EQ. It just sounds, it's got the low end, it's got the high end. It's, I just need to change my part a little bit if I need, need a right. different sound. Well, it gets into miking technique, quality of mics, uh, time, you know. And, yeah, yeah. and that's what we find out with a lot of guys, that specifically on drums. You know, they'll, they'll book two days to do drums, but if they're used to using spectra they're out of there in half a day because a they know their headroom is secure and b they have enough experience that they know that they're not going to come back the next day and go oh listen to that it fell apart here here and it, it doesn't happen oh, that's so cool i get a lot of guys telling me they can get through a drum session much quicker with our gear because of the headroom and and, and they know where they're going to be all the time they don't it's not a guess you don't come nice. you don't listen you don't listen to the tracks at night and go you know what's that have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo these are just some of the incredible things i've been able to clean up edit or remove from a recording using the magic of isotope rx great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your daw to manage plosives clicks s's noise buzz reverb breaths and even guitar fret squeaks with a set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let isotope handle the audio challenges if if you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase.
So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band, but the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you on Instagram about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version are they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Samply.app comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming high quality mixes so your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or a computer back in the studio. All mix comments are time-stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion and everything is easy to find in one location. No more mixed up mix messages from the band. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music and it all works in your browser with no downloads required. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade. Hey, rock stars! we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Bill Cheney joining us from Spectra 1964. We're going to talk more about EQ, peak dynamics, um, how to use all kinds of awesome gear in the studio. Bill, are you ready to jam, my friend? Yes, sir. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you was, you know, you had this, you were explaining to me earlier this idea of uh, clean tracks and what, what that means to you and why that's important versus, you know, tracks that have artifacts in them um, and how that can even affect the mix process. Yeah. I, um, and again, this is not from my personal experience. This is just talking to uh, studio engineers and a common complaint when uh, they have to mix tracks that uh, were not done properly. And so over the years, I keep, you know, hearing okay, this is what I got. This is what I had to do to fix it. Most of the time to the detriment of the the music. Uh, how we look at it is, and again, our, our designs are not trying to change any of the input waveform. We're just trying to reproduce it at the output with the lowest noise, lowest distortion, uh, most and maximum gain. Is when you add, when you're initially tracking, you start adding EQ or compensating or your amplifier, your mic pre's and overload, and then it can be heard in the resulting tracks, it's it's very difficult to fix it. Uh, and so our concept is as is, is little EQ as possible, um, not saying you don't, uh, and having as much headroom uh, without distortion and getting above that noise floor so you don't have to deal with with the with the noise issue uh in mixing. What happens though is is if you have a console that has a particular signature at 80 cycles and there's one manufacturer that's notorious for having an 80 cycle boost. Uh you can't remove that very easily. It's it's there. And you'd like to have something that in the mix process you could change it. You can add 80. You can take out 80. I mean, you can go back to zero and start over again, but you don't want to get in a situation where particular performance has already been predefined by the tracking itself. And so that's what I talk about. And that's why uh, the better engineers I deal with try not to do any EQ. They try to go in as dry as they can and just go directly through the mic pre and maximize at that point. And then in the mix, you can, you can do those things. You can try this, take that out, put this in, take that out. But when you're tracking, it makes it really difficult. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have really clean, um, great sounding tracks because when you start working on the mix, just you find that you spend more time just balancing the faders and just getting levels right between the instruments and less time trying to mess with each instrument. But um, you do have some awesome EQs, the 500, the STX 500 series. And maybe we should talk a little bit about where those really are useful because I also have the 100 with the 500. So that's a, that's a daughter card. I think if I'm using the right terminology, right. that's, that's sort of sandwiched together into one double wide box, but I don't, I don't use the 500s often in the tracking stage. Right. I just found I haven't needed them. W- needed them. Yeah. yeah so, but, yeah. but where's, yeah. where's, where did they start to become, and, and maybe they would be great in the right, in the tracking stage for the right situations. But are there some other places where you've found engineers are using them often? Well, they do in the mix, you know, trying this, trying that, in and out. 
after the you know the initial tracks are are done, <clears throat> they'll use them in the two bus. Uh, the okay. five hundred the five hundred has you know you hear this term air you know the fifteen kilohertz boost stuff yeah that thing does a marvelous job give you some air. Uh, I've got some engineers that just love our you know three k four k on vocals boosting. Uh, you know, and you hear these, everybody has a particular, um, uh, like, uh, with our EQs because there's no phase shift, unlike other passive EQs, there's no phase shift. And if you want plus 12, you can get plus 12. The amplifier is not going to stumble. And so whatever you want with the EQs, they will do it with minimal distortion, if any, no phase shift. And so they're really natural soundings, but that circuit is the stack circuit the 500 so if you go back to ad vision in england all the early emerson lake and palmer uh yes recordings um does that, that include brain salad surgery yes sir oh hell yeah two two <laughs> two two 100s with a 500 eq but that was a wow. custom custom desk uh you know some of the elton john stuff don't shoot me i'm only a piano player uh chateau that was all done two 100s with the 500 EQ. Now, when you get to record plant, that was the first version of our three our three frequency EQ. So the oh, right, right. The 500 is highs and lows. Right, right. Selectable, and then, selectable band. And on record plant, 70. Or and those are shelving highs and lows? Or is, or is that irrelevant? It's irrelevant. It, it, may get okay. it may get changed. <laughs> we're, we're talking about shelving right now. The, the three band does have shelving. But in any case, uh, the the EQs do exactly what they're advertised, and we always say you need a few of them at least. But we're not trying to sell EQs with every one hundred. It just it's just realistic, it's just not needed. So well, so let me let me break that down again, Rockstars. So the STX one hundred is a mic preamp, is how we would typically think of using it. But what's cool about it is it can easily accept a line level input, and you're saying that. You can have a pair of STX 100s with a pair of STX 500 EQs sandwiched onto them. Right. And then you can just take your mix output. If you're mixing through a console, you could probably mix straight out of Pro Tools, even if you're mixing in the box, and come out, right. go through these. Um, and to me, that actually makes a lot of sense because in the same way I just said that a synthesizer plugged you know, going through the STX 100s sounded better than just going straight into Pro Tools. It stands to reason that um, it would be that it could sound really cool to come out of, uh, you know, the stereo mix output of of your DAW into the STX 100s. Do a little bit of high and low smiley face. I guess this is one the one place in the, in the recording world where smiley faces are allowed and welcome. And then go through a pair of 610s or the V610s, um, right. I guess linked in stereo mode to sort of re-control right. some of those peaks. Right. Well, the peaks, it depends how you, when you're tracking, if you, if you tracked with our limiters, there's no peaks. They're gone for good. If, if you're in a two bus, and this is another thing that kind of surprised us is I never thought that the peaks would still be in a two bus. I thought they would have been lost in overload. And this is on conventional desks. <laughs> the peaks are still there. Uh, so, you know, back to our limiters, like the C610 and a two bus, just peak limiting. That's it. That will, that will strip the peaks off in the mix. And all of a sudden you can move the mixes more around because you don't have to overload issues, which again, this is, again, I was not aware of this till I actually saw it done in the studio where we just started limiting in the two bus. So, and that's where you could do the EQ also. Now, can we use the... C610s um, as mix bus, lim, li, you know, comp limiters in such a way that we could actually get, if we wanted to, we can get the mix like mastering level loud. I mean, we, I, I think the answer is yes, because I think a lot yes. of mastering engineers are using them, right? Right. Yeah. Do you know if people use them in conjunction with digital limiters as well? Um, and th would that be common? Or do you think we can get pretty dang close just on the output of a C610? That's another discussion. I'm not a fan of All digital. Right. I'm not a fan of digital limiting. I think it's pretty. Okay, cool. Pretty, pretty coarse. I just, you just don't need it. If you use our stuff, you don't. You know, our limiters. Uh, digital limiting's not, not required. 
I, you know, I don't know if I've ever asked you this, Bill, but um, as a music fan yourself, do you have sort of like, you know, your, your favorite hi-fi setup or anything like that that you like to just go enjoy music on and, and that you personally gauge what sounds right to you? Well, I have some old, old Spectra power, you know, power amps, which we're going to eventually, re, you know, reintroduce again. Um, and I just have old Spectre Pre's. You know, we even used to make moving coil f- cartridges for, for a uh, vinyl. Oh, really? Cool. Oh, yeah. We made we made the most phenomenal front ends in the world. Uh, and a lot of people who had the the budgets back in that time owned them. Um, I tend to listen to like you say Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Uh, Are you a Cop? vinyl guy? Yes. Are you put put on yeah. records? Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I just started getting back into it, but I finally. I'm back into it, but uh, never always realized the, the superiority of vinyl. But uh, no, I, it's it just shocks me. You know, stuff that was done 50 years ago sounds as good as it does. It sounds better than what you can buy today. Uh, and done on 16 channel consoles with a tape machine. Yeah, and uh, and you know what I'm talking about. It's just the the, the presence, the just the uh, and the stack stuff is even more. I mean, you listen to mono recordings with stacks. You turn the lights out, and every you know where everybody is on the stage, and that was just their tenacity when it came to setting up microphones properly. Now, are yeah. those Atmos compatible? Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that much about Atmos. <laughs> I know enough just to be in trouble, get in trouble. But yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's my point is is uh, you can take a mono staple singers. So, and put it on, turn the lights off, and you swear they're standing right there. And it's a mono recording. You know, you're just going, how can this be? Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's typically the, the reference stuff I like to listen to. Now, another thing that you were talking about was how um, the time of production uh, can be dramatically affected by peak overload and attempts to avoid it. At least that's what the note I wrote down. What were you... Do you know what you were getting at when you were talking about time of production? Were you just talking about the time it takes to be in the studio and get out of there, or is it related to actual timing of music or anything like that? No, it's just time, physical time, in and out of the studio. Okay, cool. And I get that comment a lot uh, when they start using our pre's. Uh, in fact, I have quite a few quite famous folks that they'll walk around with their 500 rack and go into a studio, and that's what they use. They just plug it into who's ever you know, the desk they're dealing with that day, but the front ends, the one hundreds. But you, you get a real, and you quickly you rather realize where you, where you need to be when you do setup, so you know where that light needs to be flashing, um, where the outputs need to be set, and so when you do a drum mix, you're not guessing, you're not listening for overload, you're not listening to you know um, issues with phase shift because our stuff is real low phase shift. I mean, things like that become real apparent. So it becomes almost second nature to set this stuff up. It's like a couple of minutes. And and so yeah. that's that's because you have so much headroom now. Again, and I even discussed this sometime earlier with you. Why does Mike, why do Mike Prees, let's say 500 series, why does everybody have five different versions, you know? I think because they all, they're looking for different colors and different right. flavors and stuff like that. Because they spec all the same. You know, they're all with doing the sim- similar distortion, similar noise, and you're going. Right. So what does yeah. that mean? What What is the, why Why are gear specs the same, but the things sound different? It's the headroom. It's the circuit. Some circuits react differently. They're happy with keyboards. They hate drums because of peak overload. And so what you end up with is with just a menagerie of different input modules they're doing different things. Now we're on a different side. We're going, no, whatever's coming in is going to come out and we're not going to give you that color. And I'm not saying you don't use those for the color, but, but our stuff is just real neutral. It's just whatever it comes in goes out. Yeah. So, and that's why, you you know, class A circuits, they sent, they overload differently than an AB because they require more than twice as much power supply power to get the signal out. Well, if you've got a, a situation where you're running out of supply because of peaks, those things are going to be in the dirt a lot quicker than an AB would. And so then you see the guys that are engineering these special power supplies with special regulation and, you know, band-aids. And 
but the result is still the same. You still have the problem. It's just not maybe at the same levels. So, and that's why it's, it's when you're doing tracking with our gear, you know exactly where you're at all the time. Whatever the VU says, what you're going to get. And, uh, where other things, it's the hidden things, the overload you can't see unless you had a scope tied to it that will get you. Yeah. Fifty years ago, William G. Dilley introduced the world to his revolutionary new dynamics processor, the Model 610 Complimeter. A truly unique device, the Model 610 was not only the fastest, cleanest, and quietest of its type, but was also capable of providing completely separate peak limiting and compression functions. Today, Spectra 1964 introduces the Model C610 Complimeter, described as the most versatile piece of audio gear you can buy. Great for adding control and power everything from vocals, guitars, and bass to mixing and even mastering, the C610 gives you the same massive sound that rocked legendary studios like Stax, Arden, AdVision, a and and Record Plant. I'm using the C610 on every record I make at the Toy Box Studio, and you should too. You'll love it. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. OWC now brings you the Mini Stack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander, perfectly sized to stack with the Mac Mini, and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With the SATA HDD SSD bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB C ports and enable you to connect to millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or mouse. I'm using the Mini Stack STX paired with my Mac Mini M1 to house my dedicated audio SSD and sample libraries at my studio, and it works great. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Um, I remember you talked about the, you know, the the minimal power drain with your circuit designs and how a whole rack full of um, 500 modules, you know, you could be hitting the drums and and each one of those mic pre's is is pulling trying to pull a huge, you know, in your case, no, but but typically each mic pre would be trying to recreate a very intensive, um, demanding transient waveform or, you know, that, that, that brick wall of that initial transient. And with the STX stuff, because you're drawing so much, so little power rather, um, or power so efficiently, uh, they, they aren't stealing each other's power, the different 500 modules, right? No. They can, they can all reproduce it? No. In fact, it was interesting when we were doing, uh, Matt Rossbang has a 20 channel, uh, Spectra desk, eight bus, 20 channel. And, uh, we were doing the calculations one day just for the audio circuit, not the lamps. And all 20 channels, I think we were drawing less than two amps. So, <laughs> wow. You know, and, and, and some of these 500s are struggling with two amps with some, some modules. And that, that's, a, that's a whole console audio circuit. But the thing is, is, is mic level, line level stuff shouldn't be j drawing power. You only need that when you're doing amplification with speakers. Right. And, and maybe in previous conversations we've had, we, uh, Dilly used to talk about, we don't build control room heaters because right. the competitors would literally, they had to have a large HVAC system just to, to keep the console in check with the room because it was heating everything because of all and, and 90 volt power supplies and 40 amps of current, just, you know, an arc welder sitting in the corner trying to drive this console and you're doing mic level. Yeah, absolutely. My my console was a huge um, oven in the control yeah. room, and I'm sitting up in front of it all the time. And we had to oversize the HVAC unit right. just to compensate for it. You know, this was they put in one that that, that would have been the setting used for a kitchen environment right. where you right. got an oven going. Right. Well, the and if you've ever been around an early Spectra desk, 
You put your hands on them, they're ice cold. Running. They're ice cold. There's no heat. Ice cold. Ice cold. And and the thing is, is that's why some desks sound better in the morning than they do at night. Because as the transistors heat up, they conduct differently. Yeah. Sonically, they're going to change. And so you had a good mix in the morning or a good tracking session all of a sudden at 11 o'clock in the morning, it starts going downhill. So when we talk about another discussion again is DC stability, but these things are not stable. They're not temperature stable, so they change. Well, right on. Um, let's see. So when it comes to the gear specs, uh, I think three of the terms I highlighted was just headroom, distortion, and noise. Are there more things that you want to say about um, why those gear specs might look the same in gear, but but not? Or do we cover enough? No, a few more things I want to talk about is, and I've always, I don't know how you quantify or qualify this, is is when an amplifier overloads, the frequency response changes. Okay, ours doesn't. But, and it's kind of a spec they can't, I don't know how you specify this, but when it, because it's going to change with the transient peak, the amplitude of that peak. But when the power supply starts to fail and you start to lose output, the harmonics are going to drop off. So what happens is, is there's, we talked about earlier, here comes the EQ to compensate for that drop in level. And so what ends up happening is you're fighting, depending on the amplitude, the source, the microphones. You have this variable always going on. So when you're tracking, it's inconsistent. And all of a sudden, you go from this mic to that mic, and all of a sudden, everything goes to hell. Well, you know, the amplifier's output changed with frequency. And this happens, again, you could reproduce the fundamental. Let's say a bass guitar were at 40, 45, 50 cycles, second, third, fourth harmonic. If the amplifier's not reproducing those, it's rolling off, and then you have to compensate for it. So it's... it. You have to chase it, which becomes a real problem sometimes. Yeah. And so that's that's why you're turning things down to go into the noise floor, and you, and the whole life of the mix just disappears. That's that, interesting. Yeah. 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 So it's it's as if you are giving us permission to gain up stuff more. Right. We're 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 allowed to um, drive things a little bit more, uh, which puts us in the the land of excitement and the land of harmonic energy and stuff like that. Right. It sounds like you're, you're in a live situation, you know, yeah. you know, standing next to the drum kit. I mean, just the guys, you can feel it. Mm-hmm. It's there as opposed to this poof sound, or you, you have this menagerie of plugins trying to make it sound like it used to. Right. right. You know, and, and then you're chasing it with plugins and I'm just, you know, and I don't live, I'm not good enough to talk about this, but I just, the stuff I've heard, I was going, well, all right, but what did you just do? Yeah, you took yeah. A, an instrument, and made it sound like kind of an instrument. So that's yeah. that's just a difference in philosophy. Well, so um, what about the difference between solid state design and tubes uh, in terms of audio peak overload? How how is that an important thing for us to understand? Well, that was part of the Dilly lecture again, and a lot of this stuff. None of this. In fact, I need to do a little bit of a explanation here. I am not telling you anything that I developed on my own. I mean, I'm putting things together as far as concepts, but all of these teachings came from Bill Dilley. And so sometimes, like today, I'm talking about one of my first, you know, conversations I had with him in front of the chalkboard is peaks, difference between tubes and transistors. And and that's kind of where we're following here. But one of his first discussions was, why does a tube produce greater levels with, say, a 15-watt amp fire than a 100-watt transistor. And the explanation was the transient response of a tube is really quite poor. The rise time is really bad. So when peaks Because you got hit, electrons flying through the air. They got to literally like <laughs> right. leap a canyon like Evil Knievel just to get through that thing. Right. And so they're not, they're not, even though they do have some peak overload, which I discovered later, they don't, they're not as susceptible to peaks. That's why a, a tube guitar amp sounds much better sometimes than a transistor because the tubes are not reproducing those volts transients as readily as a transistor. Yeah. So if you, in a guitar example, and, and this has been, you know, folks that have bought our limiters, like our little 611s and that, you plug the 611, the little compressor limiter in front of the guitar amp. And I've measured t- 
beyond 20 dB peaks out of a bass guitar. Well, if you do the math, a 20 dB peak, for that thing not to be distorting the amp fire, you have to be down 20 dB, which is basically taking a 100-watt amp and turning it into a 1-watt amplifier. Okay. <laughs> okay? It's what's happened. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, if the peak is gone, the thing lights up. And you hear the fundamental for the first time. You've really never heard an undistorted fundamental. Everything tightens up. You can hear the bass. I've done it with live performances where all of a sudden it was almost embarrassing. You could hear it over everything else because the guy was used to different levels. But that peak is so destructive in terms of output and then all the performance issues. You know, So that's taking a bass guitar, plugging it right into a 611, mm -hmm. and then going into the bass amp input? Or a, or a C610 or an STX600. Same thing. Just strip the peak. Don't compress it. Just strip the peak. Right. That, that guitar amp will light up. And so that's where this peak issue becomes such a, a problem, is you cannot get the performance that the spec sheet says with peaks. You can't do it. And everything you're reading on the spec sheet, and I even have the same specs on my stuff. It's like a sine wave. <laughs> right. That's all it is, you know, and that, but we have to have some relevance to compare with. But the real test is what does the unit do under transient overload? Yeah. And they're, and they're all different. They're okay. All that's different. fascinating. Yeah. Um, how does something like the BBDI help us in that department? Is that, is that a different discussion or does it also help with transient peaks? Well, the, well, the, the BBDI has a huge amount of headroom. I mean, it'll handle, I think, I've had it on the bench above plus 10 with no problems. Actually closer to plus 20. Uh, okay. That's that's the first issue. It doesn't have input level issues. The second thing that is it gets, we tried to really make that thing where it doesn't add anything. Now, I don't get upset when people try it and they say, I didn't like it. Well, that's more of a personal thing because some DIs add certain frequencies that aren't there and some cut them out. And so there's some personality there. Ours is just dry. Whatever's going in is coming out. Yeah. And so if you're after that, and then you can change it later if you want, you know, if it's, in, if it's track, our stuff's very linear. And I always hear the thing 200 to 400. I'm hearing stuff I've never heard before. And the reason is it's either lost in the transformer or it's, you know, whatever, however the circuit's set up. But our big thing is no color. We don't want yeah. to add anything. I don't know Transformers if have their own versions. Of, I mean, they saturate. I guess this is a duh, no duh thing I'm saying, but I mean, Transformers the the um, the uh, magnetic flux level actually just peaks out on certain when it's uh, certain frequencies, right? Different Transformers, the way they're designed. Well, not ours. Not on <laughs> but, your, Okay, <laughs> we're doing a little different thing with the circuit, but but yeah. And, and some of it sounds really good. I'm not telling yeah. you it doesn't work. I'm just saying, yeah. but what we're into is no color. I mean, yeah. what goes in comes out. And back to the limiters. In fact, I was talking to a rather well-known uh, musician the other day. He's been around for 40 years. And and we were talking about, he started using the 600 and hearing stuff he hadn't heard before. And I said, yeah, but I said, I've had complaints about that because musicians that weren't at your level, all of a sudden their mistakes could be heard. Because the amplifiers weren't overloading and some of the instrument issues that they were, you know, the way they're, they're, they were playing the guitar could, you know, became readily apparent. There was a mistake there. Well, so those, they haven't always been accepted by a lot of people because, you know, they're kind of like a lie detector. If you had issues, it's, it's going to show up because the overload is not is readily apparent anymore. Now, you can still drive your instruments into saturation and get that real thick syrupy stuff, but you're not going to have the artifacts of the overload, the peak overload, which are different. It's not entirely different. So, uh, That's cool, man. All right. Now, another thing uh, we haven't really talked about much, but you added a pad switch on the stereo BBDI, um, and I think it's just sort of labeled as instrument and speaker. Right. And that's plus, just, plus we have ground lift, right? So we can, right. Which is common on right. DIs, I think, but and I don't know if there's anything unique about that. And, and I think I said it earlier that the pad switch is sometimes can affect the sonic signature. Right. But this one's clean. And this yeah. one's, we did it a different way. We that's did a, it huge, a different way. huge difference. And that's what took a long time to get right in the, on the testing was it, it had to be right and had to have the right frequency response and no phase shift. But yeah, we did a little different way of doing it. I mean, it's not a miracle, but how we did it, you know, 
is different. So it's it does sound better. So if you plug into the speaker, you'd almost have a different responding box. It's still now maybe it's worth thing. talking about um, how you treat the pads for the STX mic pre's to the 100 and the 100D because those and the 600 all have pad switches, right? Yeah, same thing, same concept. Uh, we're really into the impedance; stays the same. Uh, what you'll find with some pad switches is the impedance has changed. And then, you you know, I used to get these phone calls on on the uh, V610s, I don't want a pad. And I used to go, what in the heck is, you know. Then I realized it was legitimate, a legitimate complaint uh, because the impedances on the, through the pad changed the sonic signature depending on what you're tied into, you know, because some of these devices are susceptible to impedance fluctuations. You know, they don't like certain impedances. So we really worked on a constant impedance pad. And so when you flip the pad in, it doesn't change the response or the sound at all. It's uh, it's consistent. Okay. And that's why I can take the C610 complimenter and I could do a bass through a BBDI and go straight in, or just even take a 57 straight into the C610 and turn right. the pad off and get more gain. Or if I want to go through a mic pre first on the way in, I can pad it. Right. And, and, and use a, a higher gain going into it. And it still right. sounds great. Right. Yep. Yes. Right but on. Little things like that, that, uh, we're, you know, what we found out over time is we've never changed the core circuits of anything we're building from between 64 and 69, nothing, but it's the implementation outside of those things that we've changed quite a bit. And uh, okay. that's what we work on all the time is. We already know how good the guts are. It's it's the external stuff that aren't it, you know <laughs> needs you know, we we work on, and that's what we're always trying to improve on. Cool, man. The first rule of mixing is make good mix choices. To do that, you need to be able to hear your music clearly and accurately. Can you imagine trying to paint a masterpiece while wearing rose-colored glasses or choosing spices for a new recipe with no sense of taste or smell? You would blindly guess with every brush stroke or think that your cooking is amazing when actually it's terrible. That's how it feels to mix when the frequency response of your room is impacting the sound of your music. Even after after you carefully position your speakers and sound treat your room, you're probably not getting an accurate sound at your mix position. The frequencies in your room can have huge peaks and valleys that are completely screwing up your perspective. This is where Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can help you with the affordable solution for calibrating EQ and balance of your speakers and headphones to give you an accurate flat frequency response. By helping you to hear your music clearly, you can now start to get your mixes right. Get a 21-day free trial at sonarworks.com. The API Select T12 is a two-channel, all-tube, Class A microphone preamp designed with API's proprietary AP2516 transformer on the input stage and a custom API transformer on the output stage. Built with the 12 AT7WC and 12 BH7 dual triode vacuum tubes, the T12 represents a new and exciting variation on API's classic preamp technology and provides you with unique tonal options for your studio handling a wide range of recording applications, including stereo operation. Carefully engineered to provide classic tube performance and sound, the T12 brings you API's famous warmth, punch, and clarity in a new design, including a five-year warranty. Check out the new T12 Tube Mic Pre and T25 Tube Compressor at apiaudio.com. Well, I have, uh, you know, I definitely have some mic pre's where I've, I've experienced the pads sort of killing the sound on things. Uh, in fact, um, one of the ones I'm using right now for this in this interview it sounds great, but if I was to switch the pad on, it's not one of yours. <laughs> but if I was to use the um, the the gain on it, it would kill the sound. And so I just, I mean, uh, the pad rather. And so that I found myself never using the pad. I was always like, oh, we don't want to use the pad on that. Right. So it's cool that the STX stuff allows us to not have to get in the way, you know, not let that get in the way and just right. get the level you need going in. Right. Um, are there some um, fun use cases that come to mind for you for some of the different pieces of gear? Anything cool or, or new that you've been hearing people say about, you know, a particular piece of yours that they're using for a certain overdub or a certain sound and 
you know, stuff that's any fun stories around that? Well, without saying names, because, you know, that, that can be uh, problematic. Uh, a lot of, a lot of production works being done with our STXs where 500 series was never used before in the studio. Uh, received one phone call from a producer, well-known producer, had a performer that was clipping everything in the studio and uh, said, um, I was told that your stuff doesn't clip. And I said, no, it doesn't clip. And he says, can you send me a pair? Uh, long story short, it didn't clip. And they ended up retracting the whole album. But a lot of the stuff that's being released this year was tracked either with C610s, uh, V610s, or STX100s as the primary mic pre's. And so you can't, you can't say who it is, but are they in Nashville? <laughs> uh, some are in LA. <laughs> so, all right, all right, cool, cool. Actually, I can't, but yeah, there's Nashville's always been an easy one, easy one. We've been there for years, you know, in a lot yeah. of big production stuff, but no, this was LA. Oh, right and, on, and, and, and again, it's not that the engineer has a problem, it's, it's the people that are tied to those folks. <laughs> How about styles of music? Are you getting, um, are you getting a, like a variety of styles of, of production and recording, or you find it that, that your gear tends to be well loved by a certain genre of music or anything like that? Well, well, let's start out in Nashville because that's where my initial connections were. And, uh, but no, LA's, LA has really come around rock and roll guys. And, uh, they, uh, and, and the Aerosmiths, they all came back, you know, quickly, but, uh, nice. It, the, uh, the LA crowd is, is, probably half our business now and uh and they've discovered what you know when they hear it they know that's what helps us is when they when they hear our gear and i give a little explanation what they're going to hear they say oh yeah i got it because their ears are so good and they're so trained you know that they can pick up right on what they've been missing so but we're we're doing quite well in, in those markets and, and europe is is picked up quite a bit too Okay, cool. So it's easy to it's easy to get your stuff wherever we are. Right. Um, okay, groovy, groovy. Because right. I know you know I don't have to. I live in Nashville, so I don't have to worry quite as much about shipping as some people do in other parts of the world. But I know that can be a, an important oh. issue for people. Well, right now shipping's ugly in the world. Yeah. I yeah. I just got a, a shipping quote the other day, and it's it's ugly. Uh, <laughs> it's well, just... thanks thanks for hanging in there for us, Bill. That's right. Um, what have I not asked you about yet? What, what topics do we still want to, um, cover related to this stuff? Well, I mean, you, you explained sort of how to set the knobs. Is that worth another, another quick yeah, just explainer? A, yeah. I think we need to go back through that again, because this is where the frustration is going to come from for the user, depending on what mic pre they have. Understand that the input knob let's just use an example of your mic pre that level sets the dynamic range uh the noise floor i mean all those parameters is controlled by that first stage so what you want to do is always make sure irrespective of using our gear or somebody else you maximize that input level don't put the faders at a given level and adjust the input trim okay that's no. What you do is the input trim takes precedence, and wherever the fader ends up, it ends up. But you want, always want to maximize that first stage. And that's where you work the peak light, see where if you're getting distortion, and maximize that because that little, you know, two or three or four or five, six dB, you'll hear it. You'll hear it. I mean, it, it's dramatic what you'll hear. You won't have a flat recording. And so, again, respect of what you use and you want to maximize that first stage turn it up to a maximum and then the set the following stages are all relatively low gain you know they're 10 20 db the first stage is your 60 40 50 60 db of gain and that's where the whole recording as far as performance is dictated by that first stage and so that's really important they understand that it's just with our gear it's a little easier because we don't worry about the peaks so we're more dealing with what the VU meter says. We're not worried about what could be getting us we can't see. Right. So we take that input knob and we bring it up until we're just tickling the over the peak light, right? Right, right. 
And that way we know we're addressing the peak, but we're still leaving maximum dynamic range of the RMS. If, right. You know, if I want to try and t- if I want to sound fancy and throw around technical words. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's and 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 the thing to remember is is um, the ten dB rule isn't always true. Right. You're, yeah, you're, you're talking about if that. You're, if you're doing if you're doing vocals, horns, probably okay. You get into percussion, you get into guitars. It's probably way beyond ten dB. You then, mean if you try and rely on the old standby yeah. of saying just leave 10 db of headroom and then you won't ever have any overload peaks, right but that's not true that's not true it's not right. true and then all of a sudden you get into the mix and you're going what the hell happened to, you know or you look but what at about it now post. now when we're using the stx stuff can we start eating up that that remaining 10 db of headroom if we want or now we're we start doing a 10 db rule doesn't and matter we're good because our peaks aren't going over that 10 dbs 10 db doesn't matter to our stx product doesn't care. So what? What I'm maybe I'm hopefully I'm answering the question right. You're not worried about peaks. The only reason I've got the LED indicator is to encourage you to turn that thing up, so you're getting into RMS clipping, right? Because that that peak light on the first stage comes out at about minus four, or excuse me, plus fourteen. So you're hitting it pretty hard. Okay. okay. Now most mic pre's won't live at plus fourteen, and that thing doesn't really clip till plus eighteen. So you got four dB of room when that thing starts to flash. Mm-hmm. So everybody else is down at plus eight at best. If they're dealing with a drum or a guitar, they're at zero. They're going backwards. So if that makes sense to you, we're up way higher as far as levels. Depending on the peak to average, we don't care. Just take that RMS level up. Well, it's reminding me of a movie I once saw called Spinal Tap, where they just say, no, this one you can just go. You can just go one louder. <laughs> that's right. So I'm pretty right. sure that's what I well, think. I think we're just really trying to say that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. And the other thing about in compression world, and I get these calls occasionally too. They say your compressor's so good, but it's so good it smashed the mix. We didn't even realize it till we went into mix. Right. Because it kept, you know, I kept turning more. Oh my, it's even getting better. Then they went to mix it, and there was no life in it. And they didn't have any separation, and the tracks all just kind of melded together. So that's don't overdo it, right? Right, and that's what I'm saying. The compressor is a very—it's a great compressor, but you don't want to go 100 to one or 50 to one or 30 to one unless you really want to do it. Like it's a drum, you know, room mic for the drums, yeah. things like that. That doesn't matter. But but I've had them where on kick and snare, they'll they'll smash the hell out of it, and they don't realize they've smashed it, and uh, till they start to mix and also yeah sudden. just <laughs> rock stars just because bill has has loaned you thor's hammer for your next <laughs> recording session don't destroy everything in the process <laughs> well that's right because i get these calls these guys get tired and these are guys you know <laughs> and, and, they, and they call this son of a bitch <laughs> and they come back the next morning and go what was i thinking because it sounded good at the time but then uh it's yeah, not yeah. the next morning it's not so great so but that's how forgiving the boxes are yeah yeah, you, you know, know it's, really. Yeah. Th- that's what I've noticed too is that I can I can push it and get a cool thing going, but then I can also say, hold on, I'm going to back it off and um, let let some more breathing room happen for this bass overdub or whatever, and just simply turn up, you know, my output, and I'm like, oh, that sounds great right there, you know. So right, you really do you really do have to you know use your ears, you know, you got to listen while, to what you're doing, right? Um, make, make sure. and that maybe is a little difference. Um, you know, some some gear you may push it and then you find the stopping point because if you go past that, you're just it's just not good anymore. And so you back up for that. In your case, I think we've got a lot a wide latitude of what we can do. Right. And the other thing is is the mic pre's are gonna be less susceptible to that because they're not a compressor. Yeah. But the compressor yeah. will will do that. But we're starting to see some musicians on vocals run a little bit of extra gain on the STX 100s, just a little bit of an edge mm-hmm. and uh, with great results. And guitar. Well, same thing with the synths. When yeah. I was pushing those STX 100s, the synthesizer just sounded great. Yeah, yeah. It just brings out all kinds of interesting tones. 
Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. When are you going to build us a guitar pedal, man? When do we get a, when do we just get like a, a guitar pedal to go into the pedal board <laughs> and it does all this peak management and, and I don't know, maybe it's compressing and maybe it's like a 600, you know, well, a guitar pedal on the way to, into the amp. We build it. It's called a 611. So, All right, cool. <laughs> Good deal. There <laughs> we, you go. We, we kind of dropped production for a while, but it's coming back, but it was made to be on stage. Okay. Yeah, no, awesome. no, no. So it's a six, basically it's a, a C610 less the makeup gain. Cause there was no reason to have makeup gain. Cause you have a, you know, board that's following it. So it's, but it is the same board as a V610 or a C610 or an SCX yeah. 600, but it's just in a stage box. And there's quite a few that they're out on tour right now, but uh, that's the way to go on that one. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, Bill, I mean, we've been going for a good long stretch here and I've, I've hit um, most of the questions I had in front of me. Is there anything else you want to cover? No, we just, again, I forgot to ask you about. Well, a couple of things we've done also, I should have mentioned earlier, we have gone to some uh, surface mount uh, technology. And before someone gets alarmed when they open up the box, this is, this is why and how. About four or five years ago, we noticed we started having problems with our, our through hole, which is the old style components. Uh, we started having problems with capacitors that were supposed to last longer than you and I, uh, blowing up at 100, 200, 300 hours. We started having tolerance issues where we'd bench products that were supposed to be the same with 1% resistors and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. So we started seeing these issues with the quality of the parts. Uh, compounding this, we're trying to get parts to fit in a little box. So what Yeah, because if we're doing 500 units, there's not yeah, a lot of breathing room. No, and I don't want to take up two spaces. So about five years ago, I, myself and my partner, Jim, we started looking at SMD. And at first we thought, well, you know, this is, you know, they could not, A, they're not going to handle the, the power, the current. Now, um, what's SMD? Surface mount, small stuff, tiny okay. stuff. Tiny surface stuff. mount device or something yeah, like that? Yeah, okay. yeah. You can't, you can't see it as small. So we started about two, two and a half years ago building prototypes with SMD. And my first thought was this thing will never handle, you know, plus 18 at 50 cycles, you know, because there's nothing there. It's just too small. Looking. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Man. So I did it. It didn't flinch. It, I mean, it didn't change. We ran it for a week. Uh, come to find out, a lot of the heat's dissipated into the PCB, you know, the circuit board. Uh, then we got into this issue. What are the, what, how are the tolerances, you know, making this stuff this small? We found out the tolerances were better. Uh, I've talked to other manufacturers who are friends of mine, major manufacturers, much larger than us. They were starting to see the same problems. 1% resistors weren't 1%. They were 10 or 12 or 15. Right. Because second order manufacturers have stepped into the through hole and the big manufacturers have gone SMD. So we started seeing we can get one tenth of 1% resistors in SMD. You can't buy one tenth of 1% in a through so hole. So that, that's like, um, if we were to imagine ourselves in the studio, that's like having total recall where we can exactly recreate you know, a mix. In your case, you're you're trying to really fine tune a design, and then know that when you go build ten of these boxes, they will be like it, they will be the design that you did, and not not drift off and and have different um, characteristics. Oh yeah, we were getting 10, 
10, 15% variation between product. I, I, this morning I benched oh, a dozen new 100s with their SMD. They didn't, they were the same. And they were actually specking better than the through hole, which leads me to the next thing is production cost. Uh, we're, we do all our stuff here in Ogden. Outside of the metal chassis, which we import, everything else is done. It's U.S. It's North American product, and the labor is here. We don't subcontract it. We, it's all here. So when we made the SMD decision, we, we committed a large amount of time and money to buying the machines and going through all the heartache, but we produce everything here. It's not contracted out. Uh, so we know where our stability is. We know we're, we know we're not the end of somebody's production run for a computer, let's say. Okay. We build them here. The other thing that happens is the cost of production. Since we compete with offshore or contract people who are much larger than we are, they can do things a lot cheaper. We are running at a competitive cost you know, disadvantage. And right now, everybody's escalating prices. And at this point, we're still able, by doing SMD, to keep the prices the same. Right on. Which is a huge deal because you got to keep stuff reasonably priced, but we didn't want to sacrifice performance. But we've actually improved the performance. We've kept the price the same, and we're still everything's in house. And so yes. I just I just wanted to mention what we've done and how we're doing it because we're really trying to keep the prices the same. We're not trying to because it's getting ugly right now. You're seeing ten, twenty, thirty yes. percent price increases, and uh, that's just not going to work for a lot of people. Hmm. Well, rock stars, I just want to sort of encourage you to remember to think about. Um, your studio gear as, you know, investments in pieces that you add to your studio incrementally. I mean, that's how I've built my studio is, you know, I get this, I get this, I get this. Not yet, I, didn't, I, never got, I, I never got everything all at once, you know? But the beauty of stuff like the 500 modules that you have, Bill, is, you know, you can start with one. You can start with a rack right. and then get one module and start using that for overdubs and really, uh, you know, get an amazing sound out of it. And then just incrementally add more when you're ready to, you know, you don't, so it's a and good it's, way to and, and it's, studio. The 500 series is not a compromise. Like I say, some of the bigger production houses have gone to our 500 series as the main, because we, yeah, we'll, I'm, I'm doing the best recordings I've ever done in my studio right now. And I'm, I'm loving using the right. STX. But we, we would run this, we'd run a 100 against anything. I don't care if it's several hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it just sounds as good as anything or better, actually. So yes. it's not a compromise that you have to buy this. And then later on, when I grow up, I'm going to buy that. You're done. You know? Right. Yeah, right. You're done. Yeah. No. Yeah. I didn't mean buy this and then later get something else. More like buy this and later get another one. <laughs> right. No, that's, that's what we like to hear. <laughs> so cool, man. Well, Bill, thanks for being on the podcast with us again, man. It's, it's always a blast to hang out with you. And I love how you break down this stuff and really help us understand it. I get a lot of great feedback from the rock stars saying that they really appreciated, you know, finally understanding how to set these units, uh, the spectra units, or understanding what's going on with the peak uh, and audio content. Um, let the rock stars know where you'd like them to go to find out more about Spectra 1964. Uh, if they're ready to get started with their studio, where should they? How should well, they get in touch with you? Well, we're at www. You know, spectra1964.com. If you want to drop me a line, it's Bill at spectra1964.com. And um, I do have a phone, so you can talk to me. Uh, but uh, any questions, comments, give us a holler. Okay, cool. Then I think the the phone number is either in some of our ads on the podcast or you right. may find it on the website as well. Right, right. Um, and then 1964 is the numbers, rock stars. It's not right. spelled out. That would be an awfully long URL. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, dude. Thanks for thanks for hanging with us again, Bill. Great to see you, and we'll see you around the studio, man. I'm I'm just gonna get up from this mic and go down and record something through through my uh, my spectra right now. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lynch. All right, dude. Cheers, man. Take care.
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. API, OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Sonar Works, and Isotope. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plugin purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of their plugins. And sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. And don't forget to use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of the podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks, guys. And thanks so much for listening, Rockstars. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.